So we've now come to Romans chapter 8 in our study of Paul's epistle to the Romans. And, and remember, you know, as we go through any book of the Bible, these are originally letters. I know there are churches and congregations and there's nothing wrong with this, but they spend years going through the book of Romans. <laughs> and you really can, because there's a lot there. You can study the entire Bible through the lens of the book of Romans. But at the same time, you know, I, I really appreciate what Pastor Stephen is doing here and kind of picking up the pace and doing a chapter a week because we have to remember this is a letter. This is a letter that was written to a congregation and they read it just like you would read a letter or an email and you know not I'm sure they later went back and studied it and broke it down but originally it was a letter where Paul a friend and a pastor was trying to communicate to them some important truths and this truth that's been building now for seven chapters is the first few chapters, we're without excuse. <laughs> I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. No matter whether you are a, you know, a self-righteous dude, a religious prude, or someone who doesn't know the Lord at all, we are desperately in need of a Savior. We can dress ourselves up any way I want. We are desperately in need of a Savior. And Paul builds that case in the first three chapters of the book of Romans. And then he hits us with a good news, the gospel, that God has saved us by his blood, not by the works that we have done. He has saved us by his blood, his work in our lives. And then the question is, how do we respond to that? How do we respond to the fact that we're saved, that we're forgiven, that our sins are separated as far as the east is from the west? Well, really, there's a wide variety of responses we can have. In chapter 6, we see one response. Sometimes we can misunderstand grace and say, well, then if all of my sin is gone, if all of my, my, my sin is done away with, well, then I can just sin all I want. Then I can just do whatever I want and God is going to forgive me and whoopee. But, 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 but Paul says, forbid the thought, perish the thought. Shall we sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. No, that's a wrong understanding of grace. A wrong understanding of grace is I can just do whatever I want. No, Paul says, not at all. In chapter 7, two weeks ago, we saw the opposite response. That sometimes it's not, well, I'll sin all I want. Sometimes we think, well, Lord, you've saved me. That was by grace, but now I'm going to perfect myself in the flesh. <laughs> now I'm going to show you how righteous I can really be. I'm going to keep this law. I'm going to fulfill this law. I'm going to do the things you're calling me to do. And then we run into not licentiousness. That's chapter 6, just kind of free sin. But then we run into legalism in chapter 7. I'm going to make myself acceptable by the law and Paul says that is equally a wrong response to grace it's not that I'm gonna work my way into the kingdom and if I live that way I'll live in that frustrating existence that Paul describes there in Romans chapter 7 that what I want to do I don't do that which I I don't want to do I seem to practice and he ends chapter 7 by saying who will deliver me from this body of death. Not what program, not what procedure, who will deliver me from this body of death? And of course the answer is Jesus. It's in the person of Jesus. And we see this now in fruition in chapter eight. What does it look like when I walk in the Spirit? What does it look like when I have new life in the Spirit, in Christ? What does a true response to grace really look like? And if you're, if you're taking notes this morning, we'll go through these slowly one at a time, but really we're going to see four things that new life in Christ, new life in the Spirit brings us. Number one, we're going to see there's no condemnation. No condemnation. Secondly, we see there's no frustration in this walk of the Spirit. Thirdly, no desperation. And finally, no separation. Again, if you didn't get those down, we'll go through them one at a time, starting with the first one. New life in Christ, we see no condemnation. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 1 with me. Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 
For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit." The first blessing of walking in this life in Christ, the right response to grace, is there is no condemnation. Now Paul, when he says this originally, he just makes that bold statement. There is therefore now no condemnation in Christ. If you have a Bible, you can see the next few things are in italics. And whenever you see words in italics in the scriptures, those have been added by the translators to help you and me who are kind of dumb understand what the Bible author really meant. And what I find is so hilarious about that is it's rarely helpful. <laughs> rarely what they think is helpful for you and I to study the Bible isn't helpful at all because it adds to it. that Well, I'm not in condemning if I'm walking in the Spirit, if I'm doing this, if I'm doing that. That's not what Paul says. He just declares there is no con condemnation in Christ, period. That's amazing. But what does that mean? What does it mean there is no condemnation in Christ? Please understand, Bible students, it doesn't mean there are no consequences to our sin. Certainly there are consequences. Just a simple reading of the Bible will, will show you this. I mean, Abraham was saved by grace. Abraham, just like you and I, were saved by faith in God. But when he sinned, were there consequences to his sin? When he decided to forego the promise and take on Hagar and has Ishmael, were there any consequences to his sin? Well, ask any Israeli in Israel today and they'll tell you, yes, Father Abraham, our father, is also the father of all all of these surrounding nations that are constantly problems and thorns in our side. Yes, there's consequences. Yes, there is. Ask King David. David was a man after God's own heart, but when he took Bathsheba, were there consequences? Yes. The child that he had with her died, and his kingdom, though God's grace prevails, was never ever the same. Yes, there are consequences to our sin. No condemnation doesn't mean no consequences. But it does mean, church family, that we're saved from eternal judgment. You are not going to be condemned forever because God has forgiven you. We have been set free from eternal judgment and it means that God is not mad at you. He's not upset at you. He's not frustrated with you. He loves you. He doesn't look at you and I like we look at each other when we fail each other. This condemning look, how could you do that to me? How could you treat me that way? God just looks at you and says, I love you because you are covered in the blood of Jesus. There is no condemnation. How could that be? How could that be possible? Well, what he says there in those first four verses is what the law couldn't do because it was weak in the flesh, because <laughs> it was up to me to keep it. What the law couldn't do, God did by sending his son. What a great truth. What the law couldn't do, God did. He saved us, and because of that, oh, there are still consequences to our sin, but there's no condemnation. We are not going to be judged eternally. God is not mad at you. You can cry out to Him anytime. We can come to Him in worship. We can pour out our hearts because this new life in Christ, the right response to grace, is number one. There is no condemnation. Secondly, we see there is also no frustration. Not just no condemnation, but also no frustration. Look at verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. And if Christ is in you, 
you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you do not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, that the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we also might be glorified together. Not only this correct response to grace. This new life of walking in the Spirit does it produce no condemnation, but it also produces no frustration. You see, so often what we experience is what Paul described back in chapter 7. All of us know what it's like to be there. I want to do this, Lord. I want to live for you. I want to please you, but I can't. It seems like I just fail over and over again and the things that I want to avoid, the things that I don't want in my heart and life, I just seem to do all the time. It's like, it's like a Christian roller coaster. You know? I'm doing well. No, I'm not. I'm doing well. Help me, Jesus. You know? It's like this is more of the common experience and it's frustrating because we're living in two worlds. And Paul says the right response to grace, the right response to this new life in Christ can be no frustration because we can live in the Spirit and it starts with what we decide to set our minds upon. You know, in Galatians 5.16, Paul makes us a promise. He says, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's a promise. Well, great, how do I walk in the Spirit? Well, Romans 8, 5 tells you. It says, if I set my mind on the things of the flesh, if I'm filling my noggin with just things that glorify the world and are against the Lord in my life, well, I'm going to walk in the flesh. But, alternative, if I set my mind on the things of the Spirit, I'm going to walk in the Spirit. And if I walk in the Spirit, I'm not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Paul says, you've got to make a decision that you are going to set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Well, that's easy for you to say, Pastor Jason. You're a pastor. It's your job to study the Bible. That's what you do from nine to five. So thank you. It's easy for you to set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Listen, it's something that all of us can do. No matter what you do to pay the bills at home, all of us can set our mind on the Spirit. There is more time than we really realize in a day. Time where we're just driving around. Time where we're working on the house. Time when we're mowing the lawn. Time that just so often is, is just wasted time. You know, to brag on my wife for a second, you know, I, I just so, so blessed by her for so many reasons. But, you know, obviously her job is not to study the Bible for a living. That's not what she gets paid to do. She's got three kids to raise, and that's a full-time job in itself, I know, because the one day a week I take over for her, I just start losing my hair by the end of the day. But the reality is it's a full-time commitment. But you know what? I, I see her get up hours before any of us do. And I, I get up pretty early. And she's up to have a quiet heart to hear the Lord. When I come home, there's always a podcast playing in the house or worship music being played. And, and what is she doing? She's filling those hours and those times when dishes need to get done and laundry needs to be done by filling her mind with the Word of God. All of us have those opportunities. And friends, we must take advantage of those opportunities. So what are you saying, that we can't have any free time? No, not at all. It's that we don't live in two worlds. You know, in verse 9, Paul says, you're in the Spirit if the Spirit of God dwells in you. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that as long as I'm saved, I'm kind of in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit? No, because the phraseology there means that the, the Spirit of God dwells in you. It means when the Spirit of God is at home in your heart and in your life. You see, absolutely we have free time. 
Absolutely, we can sit down and watch a show or take in a game or play around a golf or take a walk on the beach. Absolutely, we need that free time in our lives. But is our free time setting us in a different world? Or what we doing with our free time, does the Spirit say, man, I'm at home with this activity? We all know what it's like to just not be at home. I've told you this story before, but I've, I had a friend growing up and he had the coolest room and I loved to come and visit him and it was awesome to visit this friend, but he'd always want me to spend the night and I'd never want to spend the night because his pull-out bed that I would sleep on had a little bar sticking out and even when I was eight years old, it was a very uncomfortable bed to sleep on. And on top of that, he had this dog that would just walk in in the middle of the night and, you know, I'd be laying there sleeping and I'd just wake up to... And it's like, oh, you know, and the dog breath all over you. And, and it was just the most uncomfortable sleep. And so when my mom would say, do you want to spend the night? I'd be like, yes. no. Like, I don't know how you answer that in front of your friend. It's like, sure, don't do it. Because <laughs> I was so uncomfortable being there in his room. I love the guy, but I was so uncomfortable in his room. And I want to just ask you, because I care about you, is that how the Spirit of God feels about you and me? That he loves us, he's for us, but he says, Man, when you, when you watch that show, when you participate in that, I'm so uncomfortable. See, that puts us again in two worlds and Paul's trying to see the right response to grace and say, Lord, I want to fill my mind with your word. When I'm having free time and relaxed time, I just want to make sure that you're comfortable with this activity. That you can sit here on the couch right next to me as we watch this. And you can, you can, you can participate on the golf course with me. That I'm not yelling profanities. I, it's, it's, it's you can be there too. And, and as we understand this, again, we lose the frustration because it's not two different worlds we don't have to have this double life anymore for verse 17 says we're now children of God adopted by him heirs with Christ the right response to grace is no condemnation no frustration thirdly no desperation no desperation look in verse 18 Verse 18 shows us here as Paul continues, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willing, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation of itself also to be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now and not only that but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit even we ourselves groan within ourselves eagerly waiting for the adoption the redemption of our body for we are saved in this hope but hope that is not the hope that is seen is not hope for why then does one still hope for what he sees but if we hope for what we do not see we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren moreover whom he predestined these he also called and whom he called these he also justified and whom he justified these he also glorified not only do we have no condemnation in Christ amazing we are not going to be judged eternally. God loves us. Not only can we have no frustration because we're walking in the Spirit, not in the flesh, not in these two worlds, but thirdly, this blessings of new life in Christ is we don't have to be despairing. There can be no desperation. I mean, as Paul starts out there in verse 18, the reality we all know that in this life are tribulations. Anybody figure this out? This life can be tough. Is it my, my preaching to myself here this morning? I mean, you know this, right? Life is difficult. Sickness, disease, people die. I mean, this world can be cruel at times. And so often, if I'm not holding on to Christ, there can be a despairing in my heart. God, what are you doing? What is this world about? What is this life about? 
But when I'm walking in the Spirit, when I have this new life in Christ, there can be a confidence. Lord, I don't have to despair. I don't have to fret. Why? Did you notice there? Number one, because the Spirit is praying for us. That's crazy to think through. That God's praying for you and me. I mean, we're called to pray for one another. And I think we should pray for one another. But one of the difficulties of praying for you, when you come forward at a church service and, 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 and I'll go ahead and pray, one of the difficulties of that is, I don't know what the Lord wants for you. I mean, Art can come forward and say, hey, would you pray for me, Jason? I would love to pray for this brother. I love that brother. But when he prays, he says, I, I want this trial gone. Maybe that's what God wants for Art. Maybe, maybe God wants him to endure a little longer to teach him some lessons. I don't know. So I pray for my brother, God, do your will in him. To, but I don't really know. And worse than not knowing what, what art needs, I don't even know what I need. I think I know. I'm a real expert on me. <laughs> but how many times have you been wrong about you? Oh, this is what I need. This is going to be brilliant. This is, and then you get what you want. And it's like, oh, Lord, sorry. <laughs> I don't want that anymore. I don't even know what's best for my life. And it is so comforting to know the Spirit of God is making intercession for me. The one who does know what I need. The one who does know the heart and the will of God. I don't have to despair even in my trials. Because in this new life in Christ, the Spirit that I'm setting my mind on is praying for me, is interceding for me. I don't have to despair because number one, the Spirit's interceding for me. And secondly, verse 28 there, the Lord has a plan. I mean, what a great verse. What a great verse Romans 8, 28 is. That we know that all things work together for good for those that love God and are called, called according to His purpose. That all things. And verse means that God actually takes everything, the good things, the bad things, the result of my sin, the result of other people's sin. And, and it's not that he, those things are good things in and of themselves. But what happened is God synergizes those things together. That's literally the term. And He produces good things in my life, in your life. He's got a plan. He's got something He's doing. It says, whom He foreknew. That means those of us that He knew beforehand, which is all of us. <laughs> he predestined. What does that mean? It means determined beforehand. God determined to do something in your life. Just like I, I know what I'm going to order at Jack in the Box before I get there. I've predetermined. I'm hungry for this. I'm going to go. I'm making a decision beforehand. God said, I decided beforehand what I wanted to do in your life. And what was that? To conform you to the image of His Son. Isn't that what verse 29 says? He wanted to make you like Jesus. God said, I love that person so much. As they set their mind on me, I want to make them like Jesus. I want to allow circumstances to come into their lives. Some things they're going to understand. Some things they aren't. And I'm going to work these things together in their life because this person that I know, I have predetermined to make them like Jesus. There is a plan. There is a plan. And we can rest assured that there is a plan in my life. There is a plan in your life that I don't have to fret. I don't have to worry. I don't have to despair. God knows what he's doing. I mean, can I just, can I encourage a little amen in your heart to that? <laughs> he, he knows what he's doing. You know, so often we, we <laughs> I, I am so guilty of this so often. It's like, I'll make my own decision. I'll do my own thing. And then I experience the consequences of sin. And then I blame God for those things. God, why are you doing that in my life? <laughs> <laughs> God, why are you not being fair to me? And I, I have to remind myself constantly, what has God ever done to deserve that kind of treatment from me? I'm faithless. He never is. I'm inconsistent. He always is consistent. God has a plan. He's working in my life. He's working in your life. And because of that, we don't have to despair. So no condemnation, no frustration, no desperation. Fourth and finally, no separation. No separation. Look at verse 31. For then, for what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how can he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Who then shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword 
Lord, as it is written, for your sakes we're killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Walking with God, no condemnation. Doesn't mean there isn't consequences, but God's not going to judge us eternally for our sin. He already paid the price for our sin. Th there's no frustration because I'm setting my mind on the Spirit, running my life through the things of the Spirit. There's no two worlds. I, have to, I can stop being frustrated. There's no desperation. The Lord's praying for me. He's got a plan. And finally, there's no separation. Paul ends with a series of questions there of chapter 8. Who can separate us from the love of God? Who can condemn you if God has justified you? Who can bring an accusation against you when the Lord, the Lord is the one standing in your defense? The obvious answer to this question is no one. Because again, as children of God, wrong response to grace, Romans chapter 6, so I can just do whatever I want. No dummy, Paul says. No, basically, that's my interpretation. No, don't do that. That's ridiculous. Okay, I'll just justify myself, chapter 7. No, 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 no. It's in Christ. And as I walk in Christ, no condemnation, no frustration, no desperation, and no separation, because He is for me. You know, when I was a kid, I used to go and watch my uh, cousin, who's a year younger than me, I used to watch him play Little League Baseball. And it was, it was an eye-opening experience. <laughs> the reason it was eye-opening is because my uncle, my uncle would either coach the team, or more than often than that, he was in the stands every single Saturday to watch these little league games. And my uncle, who every other holiday were together, was the most calm, low-key guy I'd ever know. I mean, you know, people would be yelling in the corner. He's just, would you calm it down? Like a very, very even-keeled kind of guy. Little League turned him into a crazy monster. I literally remember him at one time when his son was called out at the plate, him leaving the bleachers, attaching himself to the fence, and just shaking it while yelling, who knows what, <laughs> this guy doesn't know the Lord, but shaking and just, you're blind, and I would just go, that, is that my uncle? Like, it looks like my uncle. <laughs> it smells like my uncle. But <laughs> I've never seen him operate that way. And, and, and I would watch, and even, even as a young man, I knew the reason for that reaction. That was his son on the field. That was his boy running around the bases. And he didn't want there to be any injustice. In fact, he always saw with eyes of grace. <laughs> if it was close, it wasn't close in his mind. His son was safe. His son made the out. His son, because it was his son. And I remember looking at that as some of you know my story. You know, I grew up without a dad. And I would look at that and I would think, I wish I had that. I wish I had a father who loved me like my uncle loves my cousin. And I'll never forget where the Lord just whispered in my heart as an older guy, you do. You do have a father that is for you. You do have a father that's crazy into what you're into, that loves you with an everlasting love that loves you greater than any human with its in, his infallibilities. And I love you supremely. And I pray that as we close our service by going to the table of communion, that we would be reminded of that. That the God that we serve is for you and I. How do you know? Because he died upon a cross for our sin. Because he endured my shame and your shame, my affliction and yours. And when I really understand that this God is not just some mystical power in the sky, but He's a Father who loves me, who speaks to me through His Word the things that I'm going to be involved in and things that I should avoid, well, then I can respond to that by saying, Lord, I want to walk with You. I want to walk in the power of Your Spirit. Realizing there's no condemnation, no frustration, no desperation, no separation because... 
You are for me. It's a radical, radical truth. <laughs>